you. Good for you. And then we went to QuickBooks and everything was like, ah, oh, thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. We're going to get started. You uh, have your little uh, resource and you're already working on your quiz. Jeff? Yes, yes. Is that, your, is that your son's high school there on your shirt? Uh, yeah, Jeff's grandson won state champs of uh, Wisconsin football this past year, Division II, I'm reading. So that's fantastic. Tell Jonathan, Jonathan, where my, where's my sweatshirt? I'll see him this spring when he comes down. All right. Okay. That's right. I was like, baptize you, boy. Where's my T-shirt at? Good. Good. You leaving tomorrow? Give you just a few minutes to look at that, and then we will get started. We have some folks traveling tonight, some sickness. Please pray for uh, the Balfours, Jane McCauley. They've all tested positive for COVID. Last year, after uh, songwriters, we had a little uptick in COVID here, and it looks like we're having it again. So just, they're not feeling great at all. Of course, Doug thinks he's dying. I meant to relay that to y'all, so uh, that would be right on par with Doug. He's a man, that's right, that's right. So I once again thank, thank Garrett for streaming back there tonight to our Facebook audience. I hope we have a bit of an audience uh, that is beginning to gather. And Chris back there assisting, learning the system. Thanks, Chris, so much again. Uh, Caden on Sunday was in the booth, by the way, so he's learning the audio. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that when you have it completely. Then we can really get on Bobby's case because he's been the gatekeeper to all of us for so long. Well, I'm the only one that can do this. You know, so we'll take care of that real quick. Thank you, Caden, so much. Well, let's get back uh, right to it and talk about this quiz. And we'll, we, as usual, have a lot of ground to cover tonight. Uh, and we'll get into session three. So let's see how well you paid attention last week. What is the travel distance between Jerusalem and Damascus? No, not 70. 150 miles, that's right, it's 150 miles. Arabia in the first century was what kingdom? The Nabadian, I see the, I see the word being, uh, being mimicked to me, that's exactly right, the Nabadian kingdom. Number three, who was sent by God to open Saul's eyes after his Damascus Road experience? Ananias, someone said that back there, the only time he's ever uh, mentioned. Number four, Saul's conversion story is told how many times in the book of Acts? Three times, nine, Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. Number five, N.T. Wright hypo- hypothesizes that Saul was meditating on what Old Testament scripture on his way to Damascus? Ezekiel chapter 1. Chapter 1, the wheel within a wheel. Acts 9, 23, question 6 reads, after, how many, after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill Saul. How long did we figure were those many days? Three years, that's exactly right. Three years is the many days. Number 7, how did Saul escape the city of Damascus? In a basket, over the wall, or you could say through a window in the wall. It's told two different ways. Uh, but that's, that's exactly right. That's a big basket. You know. Number eight, to whom did God appear in the Old Testament at Mount Sinai? Moses is one, and Elijah. The reason we make that point is that the feeling is such that, that Saul went into the Arabian 
kingdom into Sinai to commune with God at Mount Sinai, sort of recreating in many ways the tradition of the Jewish people. Number nine, why did Saul leave Jerusalem after his first visit as a follower of Jesus? They were going to kill him. In fact, you can almost, that's almost the answer anytime Paul left anywhere. They were going to kill him. But that's exactly right. And uh, that's, it says the brothers put him, the disciples put him on a boat and sent him home. And then Paul's on account of it is that he had a vision in the temple that Jesus said, you better get out of here. So both of those would be consistent uh, and true. And number 10, what was going, what, what was doing? What was Paul doing, let's say this, Saul doing in Tarsus after departing Jerusalem? And how long was he back in his hometown? Ten years, probably making tents, making tents, hanging out. Ten years, ten years. Roughly 36, circa 36 to circa 46, that is where Saul of Tarsus was. And tonight, we jump into session three, the Barnabas connection. And as it was last week, as I said, we've got an enormous amount of material to cover. But you are up to it, I know. Uh, but before we set out, we'll, we'll review a little more, and your quiz did some of that. Saul of Tarsus is an exceptional young man, gifted, multilingual, theologically astute, zealous toward the Jewish faith and the tradition of the Pharisees. So fervent is he that he becomes a leading persecutor of the earliest followers of Jesus until he is redirected by that same Jesus on the road to Damascus. Last week I did use that word redirection intentionally, although we often use the word converted, because Paul was not converting from one religion to another. Paul was accepting Jesus as the theological conclusion to everything he already believed. And he was, and the example I used last week, is that he's using the same ingredients, but a different recipe for putting it all together and it comes out uh, differently. And then Paul turns all of that zealous fire that he had uh, to the way of Jesus. And he burns so hot initially that no one can handle him. Uh, in Damascus, he comes under threat. Goes to Jerusalem, he comes under threat. And he has to step away completely. And then we had that whack a travel of his in the first three or so years from Jerusalem to Damascus, Damascus to Arabia, Arabia back to Damascus, Damascus to Jerusalem, and finally Jerusalem to Tarsus, where that's where we left him last week, always getting in trouble, always on the verge of getting himself killed, but at least he knew enough people in Tarsus, we think, that he could settle down, go back to making some tents, let some of that fire cool, figure out what in the world you're doing now, put the pieces of this newfound faith uh, back together. But the external travels are nothing compared to uh, the inner journey that he is now engaged in. And we talked a little bit at the end last week about stages of faith process and that Paul was likely working through uh, what you might call a crisis of faith, putting those pieces together. And we find him in Tarsus as we begin tonight, no longer a fiery student, no longer a 25-year-old Pharisee, but now, 40, 42 years of age. Now moving into midlife. And he has spent a decade sort of on ice. Uh, and we're going to leave him there just a few more minutes. Because we're going to say, meanwhile, back at the ranch. And that ranch being the city of Jerusalem. So Paul is in Tarsus for 10 years. That doesn't mean that Christian... Uh, history has stopped. What is going on in Jerusalem and in that area uh, while Paul is there? We go to Acts chapter 9, verses 28 through 31, and we see there that Paul moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews. They tried to kill him. Here it is again. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea, sent him back to Tarsus. Then... There's the meanwhile. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria 
enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Paul was such a magnet for trouble that by getting rid of him for a little while was the only way that the waters could settle. So he's in Tarsus and the church in Jerusalem begins to enjoy a little more of a quiet time and the church begins to really grow. Everything that follows for the balance of Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10, most of Acts chapter 11, and all of Acts chapter 12 is happening in the sphere of the Jerusalem church with Simon Peter actually becoming center stage while Paul is in Tarsus cooling his jets. And so we have this section of time where Peter the most staunchly Jewish Christian that you would be able to find in the first century. He is the one that breaks the ice with the Gentiles. And I think Luke constructs that intentionally. That the gospel going out to the Gentiles is not a creation of the Apostle Paul. It is the intent of God And it begins in the Jerusalem church, the most Jewish of locations. So Luke is is masterful in how he puts this together. Again, in narrative form, this is from Acts chapter 9 through Acts chapter 12, events that are spanning 36 to 46 A.D. What we find is that Simon Peter, as he takes center stage, begins preaching throughout what was then known as Roman Palestine. Judea, Samaria, into the Galilee, north of there. And he begins, he has tremendous power, healing the sick. And he even raises a woman from the dead named Tabitha uh, in the city of Joppa. Uh, And he stayed at a place called uh, Simon's house. Simon, who was a tanner of hides. Now, some of you have been to that very house with me on a trip to the Holy Land where we went to the house of Simon the Tanner right around the corner from this place that is the the traditional site of Simon Peter raising Tabitha uh, from the dead. And it's impossible for me to say this is my favorite place in the Holy Land. But Joppa, or Jaffa as it is called now, would come pretty close. That's where Dan Albers and I were going to open a bar named Three Sheets in the Wind because that's what Paul experiences there. Three times the sheet comes down out of heaven and it's, it's a great idea. It's a great idea. You couldn't get anybody that's orthodox in there, but you know, there's tourists. Uh, and so we were going to have an oyster bar there, unclean animals, you know. So anyway, I'm, I digress. I, well, that needs to all be struck from the record. Dane, if you see this later, I apologize for outing you. You're in a new Baptist church right now, and that might get you in trouble, so I apologize. Uh, anyway, it's in Joppa, just this beautiful seaside city, that Peter has a vision of this sheet coming down from heaven. And it is full of unclean animals, shellfish, pigs, snakes, uh, everything that is restricted on the kosher diet. And God says to Simon Peter, wake up, kill it, and eat it. And Simon Peter says, not so, Lord, which is a great response. And here's where we really get in touch with this Judaism. I have never eaten anything unclean. Simon Peter had never had a BLT in his life. No pork. No shellfish, none of those restrictions. It's an object lesson for Simon Peter that the things and the vision, in the vision, God says, what I have declared clean is clean. And it's one of the more monumental texts in the book of Acts because Simon Peter is being asked to reinterpret his entire lifetime of interpretation of how he understood the the scriptures and to see it differently. That was a precursor to a Roman Italian commander sending people to find Simon Peter who had had a vision himself over in Caesarea. I've been to that location with a few of you as well. He gets Simon Peter. Simon Peter comes to Caesarea. Simon Peter preaches the gospel to him. 
they received the Holy Spirit, and this is the first record that we have of Europeans being converted to Christ, happens to be a Roman who would eventually take that back to Rome. And so, after this happens, it causes more than a little bit of a disturbance in the Jerusalem church. Because at this stage, 99% of the converts are Jews. And they want to know what in the world Simon Peter was thinking to go into the house of a filthy Gentile and to share Jesus with them. Gentiles were considered still off limits at that point. So Simon Peter recounts his story. Well, this is what happened. And it is compelling. And uh, the disciples say, okay, let's just let this, let, you know, God's up to something. Let's just let this be. Peter continues to be on the main stage. Uh, James, the brother of John, is martyred by Herod Agrippa, uh, the first apostle to be killed for the faith. We, Stephen has already passed. Now the first of the, of the 12 disciples is martyred. And when he's martyred, it makes Herod so popular with some of Christianity's enemies. He go, I'll go ahead and arrest Peter too and kill him. So Peter is arrested, but he miraculously escapes from prison. And that gives greater credence to his power there. And then simultaneously, what is happening over in Antioch, while this is going on in Jerusalem, is that more and more Gentiles are being converted to the faith. So that's going on in Antioch. Jerusalem still deeply, deeply Jewish Christian. And things are starting to slip out of control with that and break the barriers that, that their faith had constructed uh, for many, many years. James was uh, simply one of the recognized church leaders. And we're not given a whole lot of information as to why. Uh, we'll come across another James in a minute. There are two Jameses in our story tonight. There are two Antiochs in our story tonight, but that's a good question. The first James who is martyred is James, the brother of John, one of the sons of Zebedee, one of the original followers of Jesus. All right, we'll move on. I love this slide, Garrett, if you would. Better call Saul. Now, if you don't know what this is, um, Better Call Saul is an AMC series starring Bob Odenkirk, and it's a spinoff of Breaking Bad, the greatest television series to ever be produced in the history of the medium. Uh Better Call Saul came out a few years ago as a spinoff of this. Bob Odenkirk is masterful. Now, he's, his real name is Jimmy McGill, and a good Irishman. He becomes an attorney, and he's so slimy. He gets in a lot of trouble and gets disbarred, gets his license back. But he's now so slimy, he changes his name to a different attorney, Saul Goodman. And he's on all these midnight infomercials saying, you better call Saul. And I almost wanted to name this whole series that because it's such a, a, a good title. But that is exactly what Barnabas does. We better call Saul to sort some of this out. So Acts chapter 11, they send Barnabas from Jerusalem to Antioch. And basically they're saying, we're getting all these words that all these Gentiles are getting converted. And we got to sort this out. So Barnabas, you go. Check it out and come back and report to us and tell us what's going on. We pick it up in Acts 11, verse 22. Um, when Barnabas arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord. He's in, he's in Antioch with all of their hearts. And then speaking of Barnabas, Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord then. Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. 
uh, the slide with the map, if you would, sir. So, Jerusalem, way down south. Simon Peter has been up to Caesarea already and preached. Paul was at Damascus, now he's gone. And so you see how, how the whole Christian movement is moving north toward Asia Minor. And so Antioch is where that great theme of the Apostle Paul, the new humanity, is actually taking place. Jews, Gentiles, men, women, Romans, citizens, non-citizens, slaves, free, across all economic barriers, something that no one had ever really seen happen uh, begins to take place there. Antioch is about 300 miles or so from Jerusalem, so double that distance uh, to Damascus. Barnabas has hoofed it north, and Antioch is, was known as Rome's third city. It was the third most important city in the Roman Empire in the first century. Rome was one. Alexandria in Egypt was two, and then what's known as Syrian Antioch. There's going to be two Antiochs. This is the Antioch in what is now, and still to this day uh, in Syria. Um, it was the center of Hel Hellenistic Judaism in the first century. What do we mean by Hellenistic Judaism? These are Jews that had been dispersed. Ever since the Babylonian dispersion. And they have given up speaking Aramaic and Hebrew. And they speak Greek. And they might even wear Greek dress. And not the traditional Jewish dress. They're still fiercely Jewish. But culturally they're a little bit, uh, a little bit different. Uh, it was a major cult of emperor worship. As we've talked about in the very first session, one of the first statues ever built to the divine Julius Caesar was built in Antioch, ordered by Augustine, and it probably was a city of about a half a million people. We know in the first century there were 350,000 citizens. In the Roman Empire at the time, any Roman city would have 20 to 25 percent additional people that were slaves. 25, 20 to 25 percent of the population is enslaved. So if you have 350 million citizens, this is a major, uh, a large city. And so who better to call than Saul? He speaks Greek. He understands the Hellenistic culture. He is one of the leading, if not leading Christian theologians of the first century. He's only 100, 150 miles away. Let's go get him. It's closer to go get Paul, Saul for some help than to go all the way back to Jerusalem. He's the natural fit. And so he arrives there in this cosmopolitan city, and he is there with Barnabas for a year. After all that time sitting still, he gets to go to work doing the very thing uh, that, that he wanted to do. Any questions before I, I go on? Mm -hmm. They were simply called followers of the way. That's, that's the term used in the book of Acts. And so Christian does not enter the vernacular, you know, 46, 47 uh, A.D. Barnabas is a Cypriot Jew. He's from Cyprus. It's mentioned in the, and I'll get to that. How he made it to Jerusalem to be associated with the uh, disciples and, uh, and apostles is hard to say unless he was converted in, at Pentecost or at one of, of the festivals. Good question. And you can see Cyprus is just off, off the coast here. And as we'll see in a minute, when they launch their first missionary journey, the first place they go is Cyprus. Because Barnabas, that was home. And he would have known his way around. And probably they didn't want to go to Tarsus. Paul's sick of Tarsus. 
We've been there for 10 years. So we'll go to Cyprus uh, instead. Acts eleven twenty eight and following, we'll put a little bit of the timeline together here. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. This is in that year that, that Saul and Barnabas are teaching. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. And Claudius is the Roman Empire emperor from 41 to 54 A.D. So that fits our timeline. It's one of the important dates of our timeline. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So three years in the desert, ten years in Tarsus, a year in Antioch. And as Paul tells us in Galatians, after 14 years, there it is. I return to Jerusalem. This is the return trip right here. Paul goes back for the first time. And he is carrying with him a financial gift to buy food for the Jerusalem church. There was not a single famine during Claudius' time as Roman emperor. There were several. And they were regional. Josephus, the, the uh, Jewish historian, tells us that a severe famine racked Judea and Galilee in 45 through 47 A.D. Again, it fits the timeline perfectly. And it's one of the dates from the Josephus records that we are able to more pinpoint this time that Paul has now arrived back on the scene. Can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, no, you don't have this, so you may have it on your sheet there. So, just to recount, 33 A.D., you have Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9. Do you have that on your page? Bullet points? Okay, good. 33 through 36, Paul is in Arabia and Damascus. We know about that from Galatians 1. In 36 is Paul's first post-Damascus road visit to Jerusalem. You can read about that in Galatians. 36 through 46, they send him back to Tarsus in Acts and Galatians. And then 46 through 7 through 47, Paul is in Antioch. He makes his second visit to Jerusalem. And we know for a fact in the historical record, there's a great Judean famine at that time period. So Antioch seems to be outside where the famine was. And by the way, famines in ancient times are like famines today. There's not a shortage of food. There's a shortage of distribution and greedy controllers of the food who won't allow the food to pass through. So that's why these famines moved around. And, and so it's a distribution issue into the Judean area. And so Antioch is not affected by it. And plus, Antioch is a larger city than Jerusalem, a more cosmopolitan city. And the church is a more wealthy city. So it's only natural that they out of that abundance. And it's a... And remember, early days of Christianity, how much goodwill is created when it is the Greek and Gentile church who sends the first large gift to the Jewish church, the mother church, to alleviate their sufferings. It is a major act of, of goodwill that takes place right here. It is inland. The port is a Seleucia. It, we don't have it on here, but the road that comes, uh, the road that comes out of Syria to the north, connects with Egypt. It comes out of Egypt up through the Middle East. Antioch is a pinch point between the rest of Asia and Asia Minor, and so Antioch is a major. There's a there are a, is a major fortress there, and there is uh, Roman legions were stationed there that could launch in any direction as a fast reactive force. They built the wall. The Romans built the walls to the city, and I want to, if I can, I want to say they encircled twelve hundred acres inside those walls. So it's it's a very very large. Good question. <clears throat> 
Other questions? Yes. Yes, there are two, and you're going to see the, the, the second one here in just a minute. We're talking about, have you got your pointer, Garrett? You could do this for me much easier. The Antioch in the south, home to Saul and Barnabas for a year. The Antioch in the north, uh, Pisidian Antioch. Paul will visit shortly in his first missionary journey. Both of these cities are named after uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian ruler who uh, desecrated the Jewish temple and set off the Maccabean War. And they're all named after, after him. He was a pretty uh, bad guy and pretty egotistical. Uh, but that's, that's anywhere you see Antioch in the ancient world, it's named after Antiochus Epiphanes. So. so Paul takes a trip, and here we look at the map, and let me give you, I'll read to you, we'll, we'll stay on that map if we don't have the slide, but Acts 20, 12 and 25, and then following two full chapters, Acts 13 and Acts 14 are Paul's first missionary journey. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission. Now that's the mission of taking that collection down to Jerusalem. They come back. They return from Jerusalem. Taking with them John. Also called Mark. So here John Mark joins. Uh, Paul, Saul and Barnabas. In this trio of workers. Uh, Paul had kept a very low profile, apparently, when he was in uh, Jerusalem. We know from Galatians that he met with James, Simon, Peter, and some of the apostles in secret. This tells you right here that Paul's a different man than when they first sent him back to Tarsus. Because when he was in Jerusalem last time, remember the text, he preached boldly and was debating the Hellenistic Jews. He like whoop, slides in. Talks to a couple people privately and out the door he goes. He is not there to create a problem. Uh, they get back uh, to Antioch. And do we have the text now in the church at Antioch there were prophets? Do we? Okay. So I'll just, I'll just read that. Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed to make sure they heard properly, they placed their hands on them, this universal symbol of we endorse you, and sent them off. And the two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of the Lord in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them. As their helper. Looking at the map here. What we've just read. Leave Antioch. The church sends them out. They go down to the port city. Seleucia. They get a boat. They go to uh, Barnabas' home island. Not a, not a giant island. They just make one big swath through the middle of it as they go. Then uh, when they reach the end of that island. They start making their way north into Asia Minor. So if you look at this map, they would have covered about 1,500 miles in 18 or so months. On foot and by boat. So uh, we know they're back in Jerusalem by mid-48, 49, 50. Because there's a big council meeting that takes place in Jer Jerusalem. So that sort of tightens up our timeline right there. And so they leave Cyprus, and then a few highlights for you here. In Cyprus, first of all, listen to this, where Paul confronts a sorcerer. Uh, it's a key text, and you may have asked, you know, Saul, Paul, what should we call him? Then Saul, who was also called Paul. There it is, finally. And for the rest of the New Testament, he's called Paul. Uh Saul is his Jewish enunciation of his name. Paul is the Greek Gentile pronunciation of his name. That is all that is. And Paul 
apparently, rather than God changing his name, God does that from time to time, particularly in the Old Testament. And Jesus did it with Simon Peter. Uh, Paul, once he makes this transition where he feels like I'm going to be working in the Gentile church, uses his Gentile name. Uh, and then he, he exercises his power with this sorcerer and knocks him blind. It's a bit of a reverse conversion like Paul had had in some ways. And the other thing to note is that in the text thus far, it has always been Barnabas and Saul. And from this point forward, it becomes Paul and Barnabas. That's the, the transition that takes place at Cyprus going forward. Yes, ma'am. John Mark is with them at this point. Mm -hmm. They are. They are. They encounter the sorcerer on the island of, uh, of Cyprus. And the proconsul there, which is like the, one of the Roman lower governors, officials, is really interested in, in what Paul has to preach and invites him to preach. And he believes. And there's this sorcerer there who is meddling in the business and trying to interfere. And Saul, at the time, called Paul, turns around and strikes him blind. And it's, it's a, another great literary device that Luke is using because he has the exact experience that Saul had on the Damascus. He struck blind for three days. And they have to lead him around by hand. So Luke is doing something pretty extraordinary with that, that the power that the converting power of Saul is now within him. Uh, it's a, it's a, Cyprus is just a little short account of what happens on Cyprus, but a lot goes on there. The name change and the name order changes, and now Paul is really the, the leader. Remember that, there is going to be that little name change. Paul and Barnabas is going to switch back in a minute, and it's, 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 it's really, you can read between the lines as to why it does that. But now Paul is, is on center stage. They cross the Mediterranean and land at Perga. At Perga, John Mark returns to Jerusalem. We're not told why. Maybe he's homesick. Uh, maybe he has gotten in over his head. Maybe he knows if we keep going north, we're going to get the crap beat out of us. And they do. But for whatever reason, he's, I'm out. And he goes back to Jerusalem. It's un unsettling for the trio, there's no preaching at this point done in Perga. They usually a, a, arrive and preach, but they're, they're a bit off their game as they arrive on the, on the mainland. Uh, so they travel north up to Pisidian Antioch, the second Antioch Trinity. Here's that second Antioch. Uh, when they get there, there's an extensive sermon of Paul. It takes up, make a note, it takes up most of Acts 13. And you may say, well, you know, we're just moving through this history so quick and so good. And suddenly, like all, you know, buzz killers, you have this long sermon. Why? Luke includes this long sermon of Paul's for the first time as his prototypical sermon. What was Paul preaching when he would go into a town? Go to Acts 13, look at that, that's his message. And what he would do when he would go into a town, he would address the Jews and the God-fearers, those who were monotheistic, that were not into all the, the, the periphery of gods that the Greeks and the Romans had. He would recount the theological history of the Jewish people, and then he would say, Jesus is the fulfillment of this history. That's his sermon. Uh, every time, almost every time you go anywhere in Athens and some other places where he debates, it's a little bit different, but when he goes into a synagogue, that's the sermon that he preaches. He had one sermon. I've jokingly said I only have three. Garrett says he only has two. Paul had one. One. This is it upon which everything was built. Uh, they do have uh, some success there, but they are expelled from there uh, by, by some of the other Jews. So they go over to a place called Iconium. At Iconium, uh, there are divided results. And after an assassination plot is uncovered, Paul and Barnabas go over to Lystra. At Lystra, 
Paul and Barnabas arrive and they start preaching and there is a miracle that is performed and the people there are so struck and they're very superstitious there. They're so struck by, by Paul and Barnabas' Barnabas's power, they try to kill a bull in the street and sacrifice to them as the appearance of Zeus and Hermes in the flesh. It's in the Acts account. Go read it. It's fascinating. And Paul and Barnabas are just destroyed by this. They are good Jewish boys, even though they're followers now of Jesus. And an act of being worshipped or an act of worshipping a God that is not the hero Israel, the Lord God, he is one. They, in the traditional sense that Jewish people still do in grief, they rent their clothes. So Paul takes off his outer coat and tears it like, no, don't do this. And in the middle of this chaos, some of the people that ran him out of town from Iconium show up. And they say, you shouldn't be worshiping this guy. Let me tell you the, the trouble he caused in our town. The entire crowd goes from just about to worship Paul and Barnabas to trying to kill him. And they stone uh, Paul so badly, they drag him outside the city gates and leave him for dead. And the disciples, including Barnabas, gather around him, and it appears as if they're about to have the funeral, and he shakes himself too. And it says, the most understatement in all of Book of Acts, the next day they went to Derby, and how? I bet they did. So Paul is nearly dead at Lystra, and they travel all the way over to Derby and have much better success there than anywhere else on this particular journey. Then they double back. Talk about gluttons for punishment. They double back through all of those cities. They don't make a big deal in it of it, but they go back to all those little house churches, house groups that they've gathered over these 18 months. Come back to Perga. You find that they preach in Perga for the first time then. They were, they were off their game when they first landed. When they come back to Perga, they preach again. And then they come back to Antioch finally, and they report the good news, and they all celebrate, even though they had been run out of every other town that they went into. They considered it a great success and considered the suffering to be par for the course. This is just what's going to happen when you go into a region that's dominated uh, by emperor worship and by, by angry people in the synagogue who won't accept our message. So, questions? Yes? It's probably a group, it could be a group of a hundred people by this point, or maybe even a couple hundred people. They're not meeting in a building like this, They're, they would meet house to house. Uh, they might, when they have a large gathering, meet outside. It's much more, oh, if we could only, it's much more decentralized than anything any of us have ever thought of as church. It's simply a way of life. There's no privacy in the ancient world unless you're rich. We can all go behind a door and, and shut our door. And, but the houses were so stacked up close together. There's no insulated walls. There's no, you know what's going on on your street. You know what's going on in your neighborhood. So there wasn't this, we're going to have a private meeting and we're going to sing the praises of Jesus. It wasn't like that. Uh, but you recognize Christians that had given up, given their incense to the, to the emperor and had turned to this new community. They, they were uh, mingling with people that were not their kind because what was growing out of the church was multicultural, multilanguage in these cosmopolitan cities. So it's hard to say exactly what it looked like. Uh, it probably looked a whole lot like, like what the church might look like in China today. There are a, a, a few official churches that the government sanctions, but far and away the majority of Chinese Christians meet what we would call underground, house to house. Good question. Very good. Other questions? Yes. Yes. 
There was a miracle there that caused the, the, uh, the reaction of the crowd to think he was a god. Yeah. So, I, you know, I don't even have my text in front of me. Somebody read Acts uh, 13, 14 for me. I'll find that before we leave tonight. Good question. Real quickly, uh, we moved to Acts 15, it's some months later, and we have the Great Jerusalem Council. It takes up 35 verses of Acts chapter 15. It's the first official council of any kind. It is the first council of any kind that impacted global Christianity. Uh, it sets the pattern for, there, have been, there were seven great ecumenical councils that, regardless if you're Orthodox or Catholic, Latin Rite, Vatican II, Protestant. The, the first great seven councils convened in Europe and Asia in the first five centuries of the church are considered orthodox by almost all Christians in the world to this day. The first one was in Nicaea in 325. It was, thank you, in Nicaea in 325 it was convened by... Constantine, and coming from my sectarian Anabaptist ways, 325 in Nicaea is the first move toward institutionalized Christianity and fusion with the state. This council was not called by the church, it was called by the Roman emperor. And you could say that Christendom began and, began and organic Christianity ended at 325. The, the, the Nicaean Creed came out of that. If you're Catholic or Orthodox, it's sort of the update to the Apostles' Creed, a little more extensive. Uh, and then all these others that met were all called by emperors to either address heresy, to condemn someone, that was not towing the proper line to settle political disputes and usually to talk about what the nature of Christ, the theological piece was almost always, they were almost always trying to clarify the nature of Christ being both God and human. And they, it took hundreds and hundreds of years for the church to wrestle through these things. Um, I will say Constantinople II in 553 was convened by Justinian, the Roman emperor, and the, the bishops couldn't settle on what a, a particular belief, whether it should be true or, or declared heresy. And the emperor in 553 made the decision. I'll let that just wash over you a minute. So... All this emperor worship carried on. All that you saw in Asia Minor, the divine Julius Caesar and all that stuff. Every emperor was worshipped as God until Constantine. And he handed the crown and put it on Jesus and kept all the trappings. All those temples, all those places that had been built to the Roman and Greek gods and to uh, the emperor were converted to churches. They kept all the language. They kept all the rituals. And those rituals are still fiercely in place today in many of our churches. Still. Right. No, no, he, he used Christianity as a binding force for his empire. He was in the midst of a civil war with two other rivals. And he is the one who said, well, I saw an image of Christ that said conquer in this name. And he was the first to paint that cross on the shields and to march out under the sign of the cross. Invoking Jesus in an act of violence against his enemy. The, the Battle of Moravian Bridge, so three, 318, 
3.19. And it takes him five years to call the council and to consolidate his power using the church. Which happens. Which happens. Um, we can go back to that previous slide. I include all these councils to say this first council is not like that. This first council, council is not associated with state power in any way, shape, or form. They are trying to address one. They have a growth problem. And it is a theological problem that they're trying to figure out. It's laid out quickly in Acts chapter 15. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch. When it says they came down, they're going north. How did they come down? Jerusalem is 3,000 feet high. They're going down to the sea, essentially. They go down, and it's, they say this, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. That's the controversy. Some Jewish Christians, they, they are Jewish Christians. They, they, they are followers of Jesus. But their understanding is such, is you're not getting, you're, you don't get Jesus without everything else that came before. And these Gentiles have got to do it the way we have been taught. And this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. That is why this council is called. Can someone convert... And follow Jesus without adopting and adapting to the Mosaic law. That is the first question. And the motivation behind it all is still suspicion that we're letting these Gentiles in. And they've been pagans. And they don't know anything about the law of Moses. Some of them used to worship the emperor. And some of them worship Zeus. And they're filthy. And they eat strange things. And they don't keep kosher. And they don't keep a Sabbath. And, and we're just going to let them come in here and be our equals. You can feel that, right? You can feel that. Uh, and our churches today have split over lesser things. I mean, there are 4,500 denominations in this country. 4,500 different denominations in this country. And it can be over things as simple as how much water are you going to use when you baptize somebody. Now, that seems silly. So we read this with, you know, with our uh, enlightened eyes and think how silly and, or how, how uh, legalistic and fundamental could they be. We still do this. Or what about this table right here? You know, there are people who will, who, who will never come to this church because our communion is open. Will you let people that haven't been baptized take communion? Does that sound any different than what we're reading right here? Does it? No, I don't think so. And, you know... I haven't picked up a flint knife and said, all right, let's check our circumcisions here. Woo! Reminds me of a really bad joke. So, so there was, a, uh, there was a, a Catholic priest and a Baptist pastor and a rabbi. And they were together and someone said to them, you know, y'all preach to people all the time. You should have a real challenge. You should try to convert something or somebody else. And so it was decided they lived in the great north woods that they would all try to convert a bear to their faith. So you know, this is a good one. So the priest goes out first. He comes back a couple of days later and his face is just all clawed off, nearly clawed off. And they said, well, what happened? He said, well, you know, he really didn't take uh, too kindly to the catechism. And uh, I beat him back with some holy water and here I am. So it's a Baptist turn. He goes out. He comes back next few days after preaching to the bear. He's all cut up and his arms are broken. And I said, what happened? He said, well, I I preached the good word to him and tried to get him in the creek and baptize him, get him all the way under, and here I am. Well, of course, the rabbi goes out. He comes back. They have to visit him at the emergency room. He's in a full body cast. He can barely speak. And he says, maybe I should not have begun with circumcision with the bear. You say, well, what's the big deal with circumcision in the Jewish faith? Circumcision in the Jewish faith is as important as baptizing a baby is to a cradle Catholic. It's that important. On the eighth 
day, if it's a boy, that boy has to be circumcised. Circumcisions took place all the time during the Holocaust and even at, the, at Auschwitz. When babies were born, and some were, they would find a priest to circumcise that child on the eighth day. They circumcised their little boys during World War II, even when Germans were dropping the pants of little boys to see if they were circumcised, and if they were, they knew they were Jews. They didn't stop even then under the threat of death. And some of the contemporary rabbis say, and, and Jews don't believe in original sin, maybe as Catholics and some Reformed Protestants do, but the, the idea is that humanity is incomplete and unfinished. And the primal life-giving organ of humanity must be marked as incomplete until Messiah comes. That's the thinking behind it. We don't get that explanation in the Old Testament. It's just a practice. Uh, but that's, that's really the thinking behind it. So for these Greeks and Gentiles to be uncircumcised. In fact, it's one of the great put-downs in the Old Testament. Whenever a Jew would go fight with somebody, you uncircumcised Philistine. David said that to uh, Goliath. It's like, you know, it's an inside joke. Everybody on his side of the bone, that's right, you could tell him. I mean, this is the worst put-down that you could put him. He is not marked by God. He's an outsider. And so, what they want to do here is is to make sure they're properly marked or you're going to dilute everything. We have one more slide. So this is what happens at the council. And again, note Luke's great skill. The first person to speak is not Paul or Barnabas. It's Simon Peter. He is the first one. He is the most Jewish Christian that you can even think of. And he is the one who first preached the gospel to Gentiles. So what does he do? He gives his testimony, reminds them all of what had happened in Caesarea. And then he says, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? Wow. So he casts his vote, we might say, to cut the Gentiles some slack. Let's meet them where they are. Then Barnabas and Paul speak. Note the order. Twice in, in Acts 15, Luke reverses the order again. In other words, Barnabas is doing the talking. Paul, you shut up and sit in the corner. Because Paul is fiery. And they know if Paul gets started, we might lose the case here in the courtroom. So Paul is quiet. Barnabas speaks. And then finally, James, and this is the brother of Jesus. And the de facto leader of the Jerusalem church. Jesus' brother came to Christ after the resurrection. And becomes the leader of the Jerusalem church. I love his words. It is my judgment therefore that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. And so they send out a letter with one small caveat. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols. Don't be going down to the emperor worship meat market and buy the meat that has been offered up to Caesar. That's sacrilege. So don't do that. From blood, that's a major restriction in the kosher diet, and the meat of strangled animals and from sexual immorality. So they, they, they want to add a little bit of the kosher diet in there. And, and one is, is anti-imperialism and sexual immorality. You know, you're going to have to make some changes in your lifestyles, but you're not going to have to come in under the umbrella of the Mosaic Law. And this letter goes out, and these are the circumstances, and I'm not going to have time tonight. We'll pick it up when, later in the study. These are the circumstances that produce the book of Galatians. Paul's first book. He tells his own story. He writes this book. But can we go back to the map, please? He writes the book of Galatians. Back to the churches at Perga, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. See, that's all the Galatia area of Asia Minor. He writes that book back to those churches that he and Barnabas had just established. 
in light of this controversy of these Jewish Christians who may be going around and confusing and troubling the waters. So when we get to it later in the study and you get to the book of Galatians and Paul says, I am amazed that you have turned so quickly from the faith that was delivered to you. This Acts 15 counsel is what is looming large over these events. And when you put that book in its historical context, it becomes even more powerful. Paul wasn't just writing a book because like, you know, I've had some things on my chest. I think I need to get them. No, it's not like that. He is writing directly back to the people that he had spent 18 months with traveling and establishing the church there. Questions? And, and there's, there's definitely the argument that he's the leader of the Jerusalem church. Uh, in Acts 15, after Peter speaks, Peter disappears from the book of Acts. He's gone. And historically, we believe that he traveled to Rome. So he exits the Jerusalem church. And it is James who remains as the de facto leader. Paul is always on the run. And many of the other disciples take the message to other places. James remains in Jerusalem until his death. And he was assassinated by the Sanhedrin just before the the Roman invasion and destruction of the temple. Good point. Other questions? Okay. Covered a lot of ground. Stop it back there. I already said to Garrett that we, I'd have to mention the word circumcision. Please be professional. He is not. Uh, next slide. Next week, European entryway, Paul's second missionary journey. And you'll see that he leaves Antioch probably on foot. Although there's a little dash line that he might have gone to Cyprus. Goes all the way through that Galatian area again. But then for the first time, makes the leap into Europe. Uh, he crosses what is now, I guess, I guess it would be called Bosphorus at Istanbul. He jumps across close to there and lands in Philippi in Greece. And it's the first formal missionary journey by one of the apostles into Europe. And uh, so we'll, we'll pick that up next week and put a few more of his letters into the timeline of when he is writing them. All this time, Paul's in his 40s now. We've been talking about Paul for 20 years, and only now does he write his first letter of the 13, and that's Galatians. So we'll pick it up right there next week. Thanks for coming.